Hello everyone. Welcome to SJS classes. Today we will discuss yet another short story. As part of such similar live sessions, I discussed three short stories. I discussed Tagari's short story in the flood. Bashir's the world renowned nose. T. Patmanavan's the girl who spreads light. Today as part of this particular live session, I will read Paul Sakarya's short story, The Last Show. Let's begin with an introduction to the writer. And please don't consider such introductory sessions as something which are insignificant. It's through these introductory sessions that you connect with the writer. It is through these sessions that you place these writers in the historical timeline. You recognize the peculiar features of their writings and also understand their important contributions towards the literature and language that they wrote in. So before we start reading the last show, let's have an introduction to the writer who is Paul Sakaria. Paul Sakaria was born on the 5th of June 1945 at Urilikunnam in Kottam district. He has published over 50 works of fiction and non-fiction in Malayalam under the pen name Sakaria. So that is how he is popular to us uh, Malayalis. He is popular as Sakaria. His works include short stories, novellas, travelogues, film scripts, essays on politics, literature and culture, and children's literature. So it's not just fiction that he focused on. It's not just short stories that he have written. He has written. He has written travelogues. He has written film scripts, essays on politics, and even he has written some children's literature. His fiction has been translated into various Indian languages as also to English, German and French. He was educated in local schools and in colleges and in Mysore and Bangalore. He worked for various publishing and media related organizations for 20 years after he shifted to Delhi. He returned to Kerala in 1992 as a member of the founding team of Asianet TV channel. He hosted for seven years Malayalam's first TV review of the print media, Patra Vishesham. Currently, he resides at Trivandrum and publishes regularly in leading Malayalam newspapers and periodicals. His columns and articles in English have appeared in national periodicals such as India Today, Outlook, The Week, The Hindu, Deccan Herald, The Pioneer, Times of India, etc. His short stories and novels are path-breaking and unconventional in style and theme. They are marked by a deep sense of humor and often become experiments in craft and narrative techniques. So as I said earlier, this is how you understand or it is through the introductory part that you understand the writing style of a particular author. And as far as Paul Sakari is concerned, his short stories and novels are path breaking and unconventional in style and theme, which means that he did not stick on to the conventions. He was ready to think out of the box. And his novels, his fictions are marked by a deep sense of humor and often become experiments in craft and narrative techniques. Just like the one that you have in the short story that you are about to learn. You have a metafictional style of narration. 
He is known as a non-conformist who fearlessly critiqued the religious and political establishments through his writings. He responds to the painful realities of the times with bitter sarcasm. A keen traveller, Sakarya has published travelogues on Africa, England, Saudi Arabia and China as well as the Kumbh Mela. Kumbh Mela, as you know, is a major pilgrimage and festival in Hinduism. It is celebrated uh, at the four river banks pilgrimage sites which are Allahabad or Prayagraj, Haridwar, Nashik and Ujjain. His well-known works include Bhaskara Patelaram, Ende Jeevidav, Ori Dath, Ori Nasrani Yuvavum, Gori Shastravum, Salam America, Praise the Lord, Urli Kunnathinde Luthenia, Buddhi Jeevigale Kondu Endu Prayojanam, Praise the Lord, Endu Undu Vishesham Pila Tose, Ori African Yatra and Arkariyam. So even the very titles, you know, show us how unique his work is. He is a recipient of the Erithachan Puraskaram, Kendra Sahitya Academy Award, which he won in 2004, and the Kerala Sahitya Academy Award for Story, which he won in 1979. Now something about the short story that we are about to read and understand. This story demonstrates Sakarya's command over the metafictional style of writing. Metafiction is a kind of fiction where you will have a fiction within a fiction, a story within a story. The story begins with the narration of another story that the narrator watches as part of a last show at a cinema. The narrator is not happy with the way the story ends and ponders on the numerous other possible ways the story could have ended. So that could be taken as a one-liner with respect to the story. The narrator of the story, the last show, now he is watching a movie at a cinema and he is not happy with the ending of the cinema. And he ponders, he thinks on numerous other possible ways the story could have ended. Now let's read the story. The heroine takes poison because she thinks that her lover has abandoned her. Actually, the hero only pretends to distance himself from her and conceals his love for her because he discovers that he has blood cancer. He had been a poverty-stricken singer and it is the rich heroine who had helped him achieve success. So from the very first paragraph, you know, we are through the first paragraph we are introduced to the setting. It's a place where the narrator is watching some kind of a performance. We are not sure whether it is a theatrical performance or a cinematic performance. But we understand that there is a heroine and hero as part of the story. The story that the narrator is witnessing. And we have a kind of a crisis that is being experienced by the hero and the heroine. The heroine consumes poison because she thinks that her lover has abandoned her. And on the other side, we have the reality being narrated. The hero pretends to distance himself from the heroine because he realized that he was having or he was diagnosed to have blood cancer. That is why he distanced himself from the heroine. Now, hero is a poverty-stricken singer and it is a rich heroine who had helped him achieve success. So we, we begin on a note of crisis. Let's read further and try to understand how this is going to, you know, to be resolved. Plunged into despair by the hero's neglect, the heroine yields to her father's persuasion to marry someone else. Her fiancé is 
In fact, the doctor who diagnosed her lover's cancer, but she does not know this. So we have more complications setting in. No, plunged into despair by the hero's neglect, the heroine, she agrees with her father to marry someone else. This heroine's fiancé, the fiancé is the man to whom this heroine is in engaged. Now her fiancé is the doctor who diagnosed the heroine's lover with cancer, but she has no idea about this. He lives in Madurai. The doctor, who is the heroine's fiancé, lives in Madurai. The hero and heroine live in Madras. So these are their locations. The hero and heroine, they live in Madras. And the fiancé, the person, the man to whom the heroine is encased, he lives in Madurai. The disease was diagnosed when the hero went to Madurai for a concert. The heroine's fiancé arrives in Madras for the Nishchedartham ceremony. Nishchedartham is engagement ceremony. He meets the hero by chance and introduces the heroine and her father to him, unaware of all that has happened between this patient and his fiance. Now we have the same spelling for masculine and feminine. I mean, I mean the same pronunciation for masculine and feminine fiance. Please note the spelling. The spelling is different, but we have the same pronunciation. So here, fiancé means the woman to whom he is engaged. What an amusing situation. I even forgot to chew the potkadala in my mouth as I relished this encounter. So this is where the narrator pops up. Earlier, we were trying to understand the conflict that the hero and heroine fell to. And now we understand that we have a narrator who is narrating to us the story of the hero, the heroine and the heroine's fiancé. What an amusing situation. I even forgot to chew the potgarala in my mouth as I relished this encounter. Anyway, the heroine finally learns the truth about her lover from her fiancé and she takes poison. Her fiancé rushes towards the closed door of her room on hearing the news, as also her lover from his deathbed. So we have both the characters you know, rushing to uh, the girl's place as she had consumed poison. The heroine cr crawls painfully to the door, opens it, looks at her lover for a moment and falls dead. So you almost have a conclusion. The heroine, she consumed poison and she falls dead right in front of the doctor as well as her hero. Her lover collapses, falls into the room through the open door and dies by her side. So we have something like a conclusion here, conclusion to the story that the narrator has been witness, witnessing. The hero and the heroine dies at the end, die at the end. Just before this takes place, however, a smile lights up the heroine's face as she catches sight of the hero through the half-open door. So we are again taken to the final moments of the hero and the heroine. So just before this takes place, and just before the hero and heroine fell dead, a smile lights up the heroine's face as she catches sight of the hero through the half open door. So she is very happy that she saw the man she loved, the hero. The smile made my flesh tinkle. It led me to believe for a moment that all would be well, that there was still a possibility that things would end happily. So this is not what the narrator expected. Now when he saw the heroine smiling at the hero, the narrator expected that there might be a different ending to the story. He believed that you know, there will be another possibility. There will be a possibility that things would end happily. It seemed to me that the heroine's fiancé 
who was a doctor and a man of excellent character as well, would be able to save both of them. So this is what the narrator expected. Now since uh, the doctor was a gentleman, the narrator expected that he would save both the hero and the heroine. The hero and heroine would then express their gratitude to him and enter a new and joyful chapter of their lives. So the narrator continues narrating how he, or what his expectations were when he saw that final flash of smile on the face of the heroine. The narrator thought that the hero and heroine would express their gratitude to the doctor for saving their lives and then they would enter a new and joyful chapter in their lives. The narrator says, This is what I hoped would flow from the power of her smile. But what actually happens is that both of them slide down in slow motion like falling leaves and die while the fiancé and others look on and are tra trapped in a freeze shot. So, opposed to what or on the contrary to what the, doc the narrator thought, what really happens on screen is the hero and heroine falls dead. The two dead lovers are also caught in a freeze shot. A freeze shot is when a happens when a single frame shows repeatedly on the screen. When a single frame states, stays on the screen for a while. That is what a freeze shot is. The two dead lovers are also caught in a freeze shot. Afterwards, there is only the silver screen. Silver screen refers to the white or silvered surface where you know films are projected. So afterwards, there is only the silver screen and the shadows of the viewers' heads as they got up and moved through the last rays of the light from the projector. So there we come to the end of the uh, movie that the narrator was watching. So the conclusion to the movie wasn't something which was expected by the narrator. There could have been other possibilities. And it's right here that we understand that we are at a cinema and that the narrator was actually watching a movie. I walked along the deserted corridor of the cinema house and climbed the steps to the projection room. So he doesn't leave the cinema, instead he you know, goes into the projection room. I opened the door a little. The projectionist was rewinding the reels. I said to him, so many possibilities were open to the hero and heroine. So many opportunities to change the course of their lives. So he is still upset. The narrator is still upset by the ending of the movie. And he says and he conveys that to the projectionist. He says so many possibilities were open to the hero and heroine. There were many other opportunities. The story could have end ended in a different way. The projectionist you know, uh, does not seem to mind him at all. Uh, he placed a reel in the round tin case. He continues doing what he was doing earlier. I said to him, Shall we start the film tomorrow from the point at which the heroine smiles and work out the possibilities it offers? Or else we would hold back a reel or two and make some other changes. So the narrator, he somehow wants to bring in a happy ending to the movie. He doesn't want the movie to end on a note of gloominess in a sorrowful way and he wants to change that ending and he makes this request to the projectionist. Now, shall we work out the other possibilities it offers? Now, shall we hold back a reel or two and make some other changes? So he's having a discussion with the projectionist as to the ending of the movie. He even gives some examples. He says, for example, if the hero does not go to Madurai for the music concert. Look, let us open these boxes and see what we can do. Do you have a pair of scissors? So he even wants to edit the movie. He says, you know, what if the hero did not go to Madurai for the music concert? Then he would not perhaps diagnose his disease and the hero and heroine would have a you know, happy life, at least for some period of time. 
I leaned against the smooth body of the projector and pointed out many alternatives to him, many new directions that the heroes and heroines' lives could have taken. So the narrator, he does not stop with that particular example. He suggests other endings to the movie to the projectionist. But the projectionist seemed, you know, he lacked any kind of interest. The heroine's dying smile, the smile that filled her face, face with such radiance, distresses me. So this is what, you know, disturbs him. This is what causes, you know, psychological suffering or something which disturbs the narrator. The dying smile. Now from that particular moment, the story could have been changed. The story could have progress, progressed in some other way. I feel that a whole new life could have taken shape from it. So the narrator believes that from that particular smile that she had at the moment of her death, you know, the story could have taken a different shape. The story could have ended in a different manner. Why didn't it happen that way? Can't you help me at all? So it's like the narrator, he wants the help of the projectionist to change the ending of the movie. That is why perhaps he asked for a pair of scissors so that he can edit the movie. He can cut the films and make some sort of editing. He said to me, this was the last show, my friend. These boxes must leave town tomorrow. So that conveys the idea that there is no possibility for an editing. What has been recorded has been recorded. There shall not be another ending for the movie. He put the last real case into a big box and closed it. Then he flashed a torch through the peephole in front of the projector and looked into the cinema house. I peered over his shoulder for a glimpse of the silver screen. But the light from the torch flickered and slipped into the darkness halfway down the length of the hall. So the projectionist, he made sure that there wasn't anybody in the, uh, in the cinema, in the cinema hall. He flicked a switch and opened another little window. Lights came alive like stars in a night sky and began to glow all over the ceiling. We watched the lights for a while. Then he said, if only there was a moon as well. I said, we need clouds too. That's right, he said, and wind and streaks of lightning. And also the possibility of sunrise and sunset. He closed the peepholes and birds flying back to their nest at dusk, I said. So here you have a discussion, a conversation happening between the narrator and the projectionist. You know, they, both of them are viewing the cinema hall. You know, and lights came alive like stars in a night sky and began to glow all over the ceiling. So we have, you know, surrealistic descriptions of the cinema hall being given there. You have the, you know, clash between reality and, you know, the unreal elements that are there, uh, perhaps inside the cinema hall or the movie that they were watching earlier. So the narrator says, you know, uh, we must have clouds too. We must have birds flying back to their nest at dusk. We should have all these sights and sounds in it. So he wants the entire environment to turn surreal. As I went stumbling down the steps in the dark, I looked into the distant sky and saw the signs of a moonrise spread over the horizon like the glow from an unseen pit of fire. So even though the narrator watched uh, or witnessed a witnessed an unhappy ending you know when he goes out he uh, sees an optimistic sight you now he, he watches a moon rise you know which is spread over the horizon and this brings in and this you know brings some sort of optimism hope into the mind of the narrator and this is a very short story when you compare it with the other stories that we read earlier the story actually points out the immense possibilities of life, the numerous ways through which you know life can proceed, the unexpected nature of life. Even that can be you know uh, pointed out here because the story did not end in the manner that the narrator expected it, and also the story you know it's indicative of how rich life can be if we blend the right mixture or make the correct choices. 
And that is why the narrator wanted the story to end in a different manner. He believed that you know, from the heroine's dying smile, you know, uh, they could have been, they could have another life that took shape from it. The narrator that we see in the story is not a passive spectator. Now, he is an active viewer who believes that, as I said earlier, as we read earlier, a whole new life could have taken shape from the ending of the cinema. We see that the you know uh, the narrator he takes the role of a, an artist, a creator, because he wanted a pair of scissors to edit and remake the movie and to have uh, to give the movie another ending. So we find that the narrator he is not a passive spectator, but he is an active viewer. As I said earlier, he even takes the role of an artist or creator, or he wants to take the role of an artist or creator so that he can give a better ending to the movie. So that is all for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Once again, let me thank all those who joined me here today. If you have any doubts, uh, you can post that as comment under this particular video lesson posted on YouTube. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.